Welcome back to the podcast. I am, first of all, do you love my horses? If you're watching the video on YouTube, I got a new uh, uh, print, canvas print for my podcast background. It's a it's a band of wild white horses or grays, I think that they're called, and they're beautiful. And um, it's just as inspiration because the horses, especially the wild horses, are part of my highest calling and just making them sovereign again and protecting them. So that is inspiration. I have my sunflowers here, which have always been my favorite. And as it turns out with your highest calling, there are a lot of clues in your life, which will tell you something about what your highest calling is. It's usually not too far from what you know to be true about yourself. And yet high achieving, very bright, talented, intuitive women have a tendency to make ourselves wrong for liking certain things or for not fitting into what everybody else is doing or how, every, how everyone else is living their lives. And so we tend to ignore those things that are very close to our hearts, in fact, that are part of our highest calling. So for example, I could never figure out why in the world I would have been born in Eastern Oregon in the US and um, in, you know, in cornfields and with cows. In fact, the story of my birth is that my parents were delayed getting to the hospital because they had to wait for a, a herd of cows to cross the road. And I could never figure out why I grew up in Western South Dakota, which is a rural area when I love to travel and I love to go new places and try new things. And when I came to discover, of course, that the horses, in fact, the wild horses have always been a part of my highest calling, it then began to make sense because in Eastern Oregon, there is a herd of wild horses. And in Western South Dakota, there are horses all over the place in ranch land. And I grew up watching my friend's rodeo, and I grew up moving cattle on my my friend Anne's ranch with her granddad and riding horses when I was a kid. And um, as an adult in psychology, I did a lot of equine-assisted leadership trainings early on, uh, facilitating those. I had one of my great awakenings of my life with a horse named Annie down at Miraville Spa here in, in Arizona. And of course, the Salt River wild horses are within maybe 10 miles of my house. So as I came to realize that the wild horses were a big part of my calling, that part of my life began to make sense, why I was born where I was and why I was raised where, where I was and why I was drawn here to Arizona as well. And so that will be the case for you too, as you unfurl your highest calling. This weekend, I'm headed to Sedona to facilitate a highest calling retreat with one of my clients who has stepped into that program. Uh, she is traveling here. We are going to spend three days together hiking the canyons of Sedona, going to some of the vortexes, meditating. I'm going to host a cacao ceremony for her and just allowing herself to sink into the, the energy of Sedona and let Sedona guide the, the retreat is actually what I've been guided to, um, to, to, embody as we as we head into the weekend. So I'm sharing this all of, uh, all with you for a reason because there are a couple of you out there in my world who have been sort of watching and wondering what's Robin up to over there and who is she channeling and what is she up to? But ultimately, uh, I am focusing on facilitating women's highest calling and how it relates to everything. Because here's the thing about our highest calling, we have to have a lot of money in order to live out our highest calling. And it is not just for us, of course, um, our living expenses are what they are and so on, but it is for facilitating um, the highest calling. So for me with the wild horses, I've been studying, <clears throat> I've been studying the sanctuaries and I've been watching the, the people who are intimately involved in rescuing wild horses from the Bureau of Land Management who sets traps for them, who um, refers to them as unauthorized livestock on um, federal federal land. There's all kinds of things that are going on. So I'm watching all of this and deciding how I'm going to facilitate. But I do know one thing is sure that um, to liberate the wild horses and to make sure that they continue to be free, um, it is going to require a lot of financial capital to do that. And that is... Um, that is the case with everybody's highest calling. And so not being all about the money for ourselves, but uh, channeling the money into the programs and into the causes, into the callings that are ours to steward. That is the reason that 
that I do this work. And what I find is that um, the money will follow your highest calling. So if you are a spiritual entrepreneur and you have been doing this for a long time and you've sort of capped out your income, chances are pretty good that you don't know what your highest calling is yet. Because once you do and you step into it, that is when the money will flow in hundreds of thousands of dollars rather than tens of thousands of dollars. And that is what my highest calling program is all about beyond just learning your highest calling. It really is about stepping into it and then accumulating the financial resources in order to be able to live out and fully express your highest calling. So if that is something that you are resonating with, I would love to invite you to reach out to me. You can just email me at robin at drrobinmckay.com and let me know that you'd like to have a conversation about working together on facilitating the expression of your highest calling. It could be channeling a book. It could be rescuing wild horses. We don't know what it is yet. But um, it is for people who are really at the top of their game professionally. They've done everything that they came here to do, and they're wondering what is next. And that is where I come in. I am the queen of, of facilitating what is next for you. Um, so email me and let me know that you are wanting to have a conversation about working together. My highest calling program is a six-figure investment, and I find that uh, it really has to be that in order to hold you in the space of your highest calling and also for you to take your highest calling seriously. So it is not for everybody, but if you feel like you're leaning into this and you would like to meet me in Sedona and to unfurl your highest calling this year, then let's have that conversation and dive in. And now I would like to get on with our regular show now that I've made that announcement. I've been facilitating preparing the channel, which is a, a it's actually a Voxer community, which I'm trying for the first time. And uh, we have 22, 21 or 22 people who are participating in preparing the channel. And it is really a 21 day journey uh, with channeled messages every single day to prepare the physical body, mind and spirit to receive high frequencies like wealth consciousness. Um, and even like benevolent high frequency beings like my channel, Marisol, who is a, an 18th dimensional being or beyond. Um, I think that there are sometimes not words for the frequencies that um, our benevolent channels come through on, but that is the probably the closest, um, the closest assessment, I would say. And um, so Marisol has been channeling and I, Robin, have been participating in the way that I can as she channels these messages to the uh, preparing the channel um, participants. And it has been lovely because I'm learning things along the way as well. And one of the things that happened yesterday is that we had a Q&A call, which lasted a little bit over an hour, where the participants in preparing the channel were able to come in and sit with me and Marisol and ask Marisol questions about everything from, why is my body feeling like this as I'm receiving these spiritual intelligence codes, for example, or or what is the best way for me to integrate the codes? Or I'm in an existential crisis because I've just realized something about my highest calling. And I don't know how to navigate this. And then there was a question that came through that was uh, mind-blowing even to me. And so I want to share that with you because it has to do with something that especially high-achieving women have I don't know what word to use. I was going to say battled, but I don't think that that is the right word for it. It's something that that you will get when, when I share what it is, and that is competition. One of the things that we know for sure as we prepare the channel to receive high frequencies is that we have to neutralize what I would call lower frequencies of frequencies of worry and fear, comparison despair, not enoughness, why is she further along than I am, that kind of comparison thing, but also competition. And one of the things that Maricel said in one of the early episodes of preparing the channel, she said, we have to move away from who's channeling best. It is not a competition. The channels are not meant to be in competition. We are meant to be in contribution. And, um, 
we are just meant to be focusing on what we are meant to be channeling and not worrying about what anyone else is channeling or how they're talking about things or what they're talking about or even who they're channeling or if they're channeling properly. But these are all the things that I would say the ego mind gets wrapped up in, in the comparison and competition cycle that uh, runs rampant on this planet right now. It is something that we grew up in. It's something that we have lived with our entire lives, especially with, as high achievers, comparing and competing with other people, especially with other women who are also just out there doing their best in the world. And some of us would say that we thrive on competition. So it's probably very difficult to hear that maybe you need to let go of competition. And I would not say that, but I do know that a lot of women are punished and shamed for being competitive. Why are you so competitive? Why does it matter what anybody else is doing? You pay attention to what you are doing and so on, or compete against yourself. That was another thing I always heard. But there are those of us who thrive on competition. I just, in one of the, uh, the mastermind that I do for spiritual entrepreneurs, we had a 10K in December challenge. All of these entrepreneurs are at about the 5K level. So um, we had a 10K challenge and one of them, one of the members of that group rose to the occasion. She blew the 10K out of the, the water. It was the most money she had ever made in a month. And uh, she thrived on the competition. Even though she wasn't truly competing against anybody else, she loved the challenge. And there was an internalized sense of competition that really drove her to go well beyond what the what the initial goal was. And so maybe you're like her, maybe you're like me. I love challenge too. I was a competitor my whole life. I ran my first race when I was two years old and I was the youngest one in the race and I finished it. And a man I remember came up and gave me a silver dollar. So I got paid to run when I was a little girl and uh, I get paid to run as an adult, a young adult, as I ran track in college on scholarship. And um, I've always been a competitor. And so to hear in the spiritual entrepreneur community that we need to release competition or stop competing with other channels is kind of a tough pill to swallow. But Marisol had a really good take on it. And that is what I want to share with you today is that what Marisol said to me and to the, the people who were on the Q&A for preparing the channel, she said, what happens when light warriors are not at war? What happens when light warriors don't think that there is a war to, to, uh, to fight? They compete. And they get into competitions with other light warriors. And that is how they hone their skills. And that is how they keep their swords sharp for when another war breaks out. And if there is a time of peace, and that time of peace lasts too long, then a warrior is going to find something to fight about, find something to compete over, because it is their nature to compete. So competition exists in our third energy center, our third attunement center, we will call it. It is our the center of our personal power, our personal will. And for those of us who very much thrive on competition, uh, competition is not something that we would say that you need to let go of. Instead, we need to uh, redefine what it means to be competitive and who we are meant to be competitive with or who we are meant to be in battle with even, if you will. So a lot of times, especially for high achievers and especially for those of us women who are competitive, when we are told we're not supposed to be competitive, it gets a little bit confusing and it gets a little bit uh, mm, frustrating, I would say, because it is in our nature. It gets a little bit frustrating because it is in our nature to compete. And so when the world would tell us, stop competing, it doesn't compute. So I am reminded of The Hunger Games. Do you remember that? Uh, it was the book series first, and then, of course, it became a very popular movie series. Uh, in, in one of the last episodes, I want to think it was the last episode when Katniss uh, goes back into the arena and they start figuring out that there is a game master and there is a master plot that goes beyond just the, the Hunger Games themselves. Hamish, uh, Katniss's mentor, says to her before she, she goes back into the arena, just remember who the real enemy is. 
Because in competition, in games, we make each other the enemy in some way. And we are not the enemy. And when we are looking at light warriors, people who are here to bring about the, um, well, the restoration of the planet to the people and to the, the beings, like the wild horses, we have to remember who the real enemy is. And that is why we require competition. That is why we require our competitive spirit. It is for fighting the true battles. It's not for fighting each other. And it certainly isn't about competing with each other in business. And in, in that way, there is the invitation and the it is time actually to leave the field of competition. Um, we would say the, the human field of competition and to step fully into the field of creativity and the field of endless possibilities that is the frequency that we can create from our highest calling and that we can that we can actually do the work that we came here to do. So I was fascinated by that because um, I had not thought about competition as being something that is actually a good thing, even though I do know it is a good thing. Um, but one of the things that I want to share with you as a high performing leader is that if there is anything inside of you that makes you feel like you're wrong for being competitive, let's just disintegrate that from your field and neutralize it. And then let's direct your competition, your competitive spirit, your competitive nature in the direction that it is meant to go, which is into your highest calling. Your competitive spirit is your, is your fuel for your highest calling. It is your personal will. It is the fire for the thing that you came here for. So the um, in the past, maybe you got caught up in what somebody else is doing. Well, if I just do what she's doing, or why is she doing better than I am? Or why is she outperforming me? And then we feel bad about ourselves and we feel like we're not enough. And that hurts our businesses uh, because it is very hard to, it is very hard to experience the success that you desire when you're constantly making yourself wrong for not being where you think you ought to be. And so when we redirect the spirit of competition to something that really truly matters, for me, the wild horses, perhaps that is for you as well. It could be for something else. The restoration of the planet overall. When we direct our competitive spirit there, that is unstoppable. And that comes from the highest frequencies of love, of truth. And the spirit of competition has been misdirected for so many generations that... Now is the time to begin channeling it properly and in the direction that it is meant to go. Isn't that lovely to know? I felt great relief when I, when I realized that that was the case with competition. When I was running track in college, every day I would go by the uh, record board that they had all the records listed of all of the people who had, had the school records. And I would see her name was Deb Cunningham. And she had broken, she had held the school record in the 100 meters and the 200 meters for years. And I would walk by that record board every day and I would say, I'm breaking those records. I am breaking those records. And do you want to know something? I did. I broke both records for the 100 meters and the 200 meters on the same day. That is my spirit of competition. That was me at 21 or 22 years old practicing, focusing my attention, my energy, my effort in the direction of something that I knew that I would accomplish. And if I could do that at 22 with a school record, and now I have all of these years under my belt of experience and, and ascension, imagine what is possible when I set my intention and attention and focus and drive and will on something as important as the sovereignty of the wild horses or your sovereignty as well or mine it is unstoppable 
And that is the gift of competition. That is the gift of competition for high achieving, intuitive, intelligent leaders like you and like me. So no more making yourself wrong for being competitive, but instead noticing where you are misdirecting your competition. Because you are not meant to be competing against me. I am not the enemy. But to keep your eyes on your highest calling, and that is not the enemy either, of course, But the resources that are required for, for you to live out your highest calling will then, by nature, flow so that when there is something that, that crops up around, something that needs to be taken care of, that is getting in the way of the highest calling, we'll say. For example, uh, I found out with the wild horses that the Bureau of Land Management sets up traps for them. And they use helicopters to herd them, to round them up, to put them on auction, to send them to Mexico on the to be used for um, to be killed for for meat. It's deplorable, and so that would be what I would consider an enemy of the wild horses. And so then, directing my focus and my attention toward creating financial resources and communities around neutralizing those, those energies that are creating um, destruction in the wild horse population. And so you will find an analog for yourself, of course, as you continue to unfold your highest calling. And now I'd like to turn my attention to another issue that has come up recently around highest calling, if that would be okay, because it is related to competition. And the thing I would like to turn my attention to now is the fear that if I live out my highest calling, I will blow up my life. This is something that I think every person who comes into contact with their highest calling, when they realize that they say, oh my goodness, my life is going to change tremendously. When I started this podcast less than a year ago, the first podcast episode came out on March 16th, I had no idea that just a few months later, Marisol would come in and I would be cohabiting this physical vessel with this beautiful, benevolent being. I became the channel in the year that I started the podcast becoming the channel. There are no coincidences, are there? But even before that, and this time around, I would say I did not have the feeling of, oh, I've, I'm going to blow up my life. But in the past, as I was thinking about people saying, I'm afraid I'm going to blow up my life, I was thinking about all the times my life has been blown up, just in this lifetime. And I was remembering that Really, the first time my life blew up was when I was 12 and my family moved from my very safe, lovely home to another town just as I was starting middle school. And I had to start all over and make new friends and um, really had a hard time adjusting. I had anxiety. My tummy hurt all the time. And that would, I would say that would be a, that would, I would say that that would be a time when my life blew up. It was not my, decision necessarily. I was 12, um, but it was something that deeply impacted me. The second time my life blew up was when my parents took me to college and then started divorce proceedings after I was at college. That rattled me. And it created some, some systematic problems in my life. I developed Epstein-Barr virus and um, started having symptoms of ADHD that were very significant, developed a big case of the imposter syndrome. Since I couldn't focus, I automatically thought that maybe I was not as smart as everybody else or as smart as I had led people to believe that I was, having graduated third in my class. So that was a big blow up. The first time I consciously blew up my life was when I decided to, to uh, divorce my college sweetheart when I was 30. And that was a time when I would say that 
I had my spiritual awakening, but I was always awake. So it was more like taking adult responsibility for my spiritual journey and for my spiritual gifts. And so I blew up my life and my ex-husband was not happy with me at all when I moved out. He was not happy with me and he was very hurt by that. But I knew that if I stayed, I would not be able to do the things that I was required to do in my life, including go to graduate school for my PhD, including all of the things that I am doing today, really. So on the other side of what people would consider blowing up my life was this life that I have now, or a version of it, the beginnings of it. And yes, there were some challenging times then. Certainly, I um, there were days that I would lay in bed and think, what did I do? But I always felt guided. I always felt guided and I always felt protected. And I did have my guides and I would talk to them and they would say, just keep going. And so I would. And then I got into grad school and I moved. I bought my house in Kansas and I started grad school and um, life was good for a while. And then I was dating a guy when I was in grad school and we were living together. And then one day I knew that that was, it was time for us to, to part ways. So I had to blow my life up again. I had to sell my house break up with a boyfriend who is not happy with me. Are you detecting a theme? There are people who are not happy with you when you decide something for yourself and they think that you're going crazy or they think that you are losing your mind. But in all the circumstances, when I have made a decision to leave a relationship in the service, really truly in the service of my highest calling, um, I have been called crazy and I've been said, I've been told that I'm losing my mind, but every time that I, I trust myself I mean, I know that I'm not crazy and I know that I'm not losing my mind and, uh, things turn out way better than I could have hoped for or imagined on the other side of it. There can be some turbulence though, initially. And then 12 years ago, after I had moved to Arizona with another boyfriend, <clears throat> And we were living together and it became abundantly clear that we were not meant to be together. There was some serious addiction on his part that was going on that I was not aware of fully when I moved here and he invited me to move in with him. It was convenient and I was very grateful for it because I was a new PhD and I had just started my first job and it was um, a cost effective situation, but it really took a toll on my mind, body and spirit. And there came a time when I finally, at the early, early, early stages of my business, actually, and I had proven to myself that I could sell high ticket and I had had my first couple of 10K months, that was when I realized that, no, it is time for me to go. And I blew my life up again. I moved to Scottsdale and I moved into a sunny little condo with bright yellow walls in the kitchen and um, started my business in earnest. And I also, at that time, had to process through a tremendous amount of um, trauma. I was having panic attacks. I was going to work and I was in therapy. Um, it was a very challenging time for me, but I knew that that was the right thing for me to do. Because the alternative, again, when I play the, play the timelines through, the alternative of me staying in that dysfunctional situation uh, versus going out on my own and sorting through my stuff and getting going with my with my highest calling. There seemed to be an easy choice, even though it was challenging. And so it goes. And, and I, what I have found is that each time I step further into my highest calling, the likelihood of me having to absolutely obliterate my life becomes less intense for sure. Um, and becomes more evident that it can be easy and graceful, especially when you have, as I have had, the divine support, but also the very human support of people around me who trust me, who know me, who know what my vision is, who believe my vision, and who um, who have my back. Leaving the circumstances of your life behind that are not in alignment with your highest calling 
is only really difficult when you do not feel supported when you do not feel supported financially, when you do not feel supported emotionally or socially, that is when the concern about blowing up your life becomes tremendous. And I've had it both ways. I've had very little support in leaving my first marriage. Everyone is mad at me about that except my dad and my sister. And then everyone else got on board after a while, but nonetheless, it was a, it was a rugged one. And, um, and then I've had full support. And when the nervous system is healthy and you've done your inner work, you've done your trauma work and you've done the things that are required in order to ease the transition, um, it will be one of the most joyful experiences to step into your highest calling. But I do find, as I've been talking with people about highest calling recently, that discovering what your highest calling in is actually throws people into existential crisis. My life was going so well, they say. My life was going so well. Why now? Why me? And there is even some who me. There's some imposter syndrome that gets thrown in there as you discover your highest calling. And the imposter syndrome consists of two different poles. Uh, one pole is one that you're very familiar with, and the imposter syndrome is, who am I? Who am I to do this? Of all of the people on the planet, why am I the one who is qualified for this? But the other pole of the imposter syndrome is very stealthy. And that pole is, of course, me. There is an arrogance to it. Of course, me and no one else. That pole of the imposter syndrome is the, I will call it toxic competition where I'm competing with everybody and nobody knows more than I do. And it's at, and nobody can channel as well as I can. And it becomes a competition between who is the most intuitive, who is the most tapped in, who is the most tuned in. But do you see, these are both aspects of the imposter syndrome. And the imposter syndrome is one of the great barriers to expressing your highest calling, regardless of what side you're on. Now, the ones who, if you are somebody who is a, has the imposter syndrome in terms of who am I to do this, this is too big for me, or this is too much for me, or I'm not qualified, you guys are easy to identify. You, you self-identify. You say, oh, yes, that's me. The ones who are harder, who are unwilling to identify themselves, are the ones who have the imposter syndrome of the um, significant kind. Of course I am. I am better than everybody else with my channeling. Of course, I am the only one who can channel this or who is channeling this or who is pursuing this. And there is an arrogance to it. And those are the ones who are harder to, harder. it is harder for them to identify because it actually gets at a narcissistic wound that they're unwilling to look at. And that is actually going to be the barrier to them actually expressing and fully embodying their highest calling. On the other hand, the uh, the ones, if you're somebody who is the of the who am I sort of the imposter syndrome, the more well-known version of it, um, the greatest barrier to you expressing and fully embodying your highest calling is just that, who am I? Oh, I'm no better than anybody else. I'm nothing special. And so you can see when we talk about the topics of blowing up our lives and highest calling and the imposter syndrome, how complicated things can seem externally. And it actually, all of this stuff costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars in your business, if not millions every year, because we want to streamline this for you. We want to make it as simple as possible for you to 
live out your highest calling, for you to fully express your highest calling. And that is one of the reasons that I am here to share this information with you so that you know the knowledge is important. But even more important than the knowledge, I think, is the direct action, the movement in the direction of your highest calling, the, the doing something that is in alignment with your highest calling. So I am here for the wild horses, of course, and I am also here for the channels, the intuitive channels to streamline things for you so that you can just be in your channel, so that you can share the information and the codes that you are here to share, so that you can write the books that you are meant to write, to expedite the process, because nothing is more important than your highest calling. And that is what I have discovered. Every once in a while, I still wish I could, I dream of genie myself into the next chapter. But we have to also understand that we are living in a slow moving world. And so the shape shifting happens moment by moment until one day you look around your life and you say, oh, this is everything that I dreamed it to be and more. And you're actually doing the things that you always had in your vision to do. And isn't that wonderful to know that that is possible for you? And the process starts, as any process starts, with a decision to step into your highest calling. And it just occurred to me, we've been talking about highest calling, and I have not really truly defined in this episode, what even is that? What even is the highest calling? The way that I look at the highest calling, it's the intersection between your professional expertise and your spiritual gifts. So my professional expertise with my PhD in psychology and my years of clinical training and coach training and so on intersects with my spiritual gift of channeling. And perhaps yours does too, or perhaps it is something different. But there is an intersection. And when you stand at that intersection, then the expression of the highest calling becomes, for me, the wild horses. For me, the other channels. So today I am just sharing kind of behind the scenes on things that I have been thinking about and learning from Marisol and learning from preparing the channel, the boxer group that I am currently facilitating. And I'm just speaking directly to you because some you needed this food for thought, I will say. You were calling for this food for thought. This is not a motivational speech at all. It is just meant to shed some light, to illuminate what goes on behind the scenes as we are expressing and illuminating our own highest calling. And so with that, I'm going to close out for today. It's been a joy to be here with you. As I said, I'm on my way to Sedona. So um, keep track of me on Instagram. I'll be posting some stories and sharing some behind the scenes there as well. And once again, I, if it's you who's been asking for, I want something that is deep and meaningful and activate activating for me as I step into my highest calling, reach out. It is time for us to work together. And I will see everybody next week.